Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm going to invite all of us who are in the room and all of us who are watching from wherever you are, just to take a second or two to pause, make yourself comfortable. I hope you're able to sit down wherever you are and take a few deep breaths just to center and ground ourselves. So we all connect, not just through the computers and the phones and whatever device you're using, but we try to connect with each other by really focusing, taking three deep breaths together. So inhale. Exhale. And again in. And out. Last one in and out. Welcome to all of you and welcome to our speakers. Today we're here to have a discussion that's been organized jointly by the UN Girls Education Initiative, UNGAI, and Gender at Work which is an international feminist knowledge network that works to end discrimination against women and build cultures of inclusion. Our title today is Feminist Leadership, Steering a Course for Gender Equality in and Through Education. Now, many people talk about feminist leadership and have been doing so for a number of years now. And I think from our perspective, it's often spoken about something that's not just theoretical, but actually a practice or a praxis, something that we do um, in order to try to break down systems of oppression and challenge and eradicate inequalities, particularly gender inequalities, so that we can make room for new ways of being, new ways of doing that are more equitable and egalitarian. And Batli Wala, has defined transformational feminist leaders as people who have a feminist perspective and a vision of social justice and who individually and collectively transform themselves so that they can use their power, their resources and their skills in non-oppressive, inclusive structures, ways and processes, and also people who mobilize others around a shared agenda of transformation for equality and the realization of human rights for all. Of course, we recognize that, you know, feminists can be as capable as anyone else of abusing positional power. So it's not just enough to just declare that one is feminist. We're talking here about a leadership praxis which is rooted in feminist values and principles. Some of those principles are inter intergenerational dialogue, exchange, collaboration. So today I'm co-moderating this conversation with Shama, who is a feminist activist and a member of the Transform Education Guiding Group, which is hosted by Ongai. I'd like to invite all of you who are watching to introduce yourselves through the chat, tell us where you are, and maybe also tell us why feminist leadership in education is important to you. So I'd like to thank our interpreters, Damien, Minnie, and Nancy in advance for their work. Now I'm gonna turn over to our first speaker today, who is Ruth. Ruth, can you tell us something about your own thinking and your own experiences around um, feminist leadership, both in relation to your work and in relation to the context where you're located? Okay, hello everyone, you're welcome. Thank you, Madeline. So um, I am Riteria from Ghana. I am agenda equality and then quality education advocates. So I also work on the youth power panel at Restless Development and also a proud Comfort Association member. A proud member because we are a group of young women leaders, okay, who are using our education to make sure that it benefits others, it benefits the society, and then campaigning, making sure that policy makers everyone in the community is ensuring that girls' education is being prioritized. So in my work, I work with, I would say traditional leaders, the community. So I am on the ground, so I am in the community to ensure that the girls are, be, are going to school truly, they are being empowered with the interventions that we have for them. And then one thing I would say is that we cannot talk about gender equality 
and put tradition, culture, and then social norms aside because it forms the basis. Our traditions, our culture forms the basis of what we are fighting against. Unfortunately, the tradition and culture over the years has been patriarchal. Yes, and I say that with no remorse because if you look at some of the cultural practices, what we are accepting as social norms, they are not things that dignify women. They are not things that empower young women to speak up. Rather, they are, they are de-empowering the little voice that girls and young women have. And so if you want to talk about gender equality, we can have this conversation without looking at tradition, without looking at social norms, without looking at culture. And then I'll ask, can you boldly, okay, on top of your head, just list about 10 cultural practices where you are that really uplifts girls, that really uplifts women, that empower young women? How many of these practices do that? Just a few. So it tells us that the conversation about gender equality is not just at the high level, it should come down to the traditions and culture in which we find ourselves. And then what society even terms as normal for a girl to do or a boy to do, is it really normal? Again, is it empowering me? If society is telling me to do something, do I find that thing empowering? Is it uplifting? If it's not, then it's something that we have to take another look at. Because these norms form the basis, the foundation of our world. Our tradition form the foundation of our world. So if you are going to talk about gender equality without looking at the traditions that we live by, then there's a problem. And I will also say that whoever is at the table talking about gender equality, talking about girls' education, is it? Is it that the person really understands the conversation from a point that, oh, okay, so as I sit here, I really believe that if girls are given the opportunity, they can excel, they can contribute. Is this the point we are having the conversation from? Or we are all talking about it because everyone is talking about it. Then there is a huge problem. There is a very big problem. If you are at the table talking about gender equality, girls' education, women empowerment, and you truly do not understand and believe that women deserve a seat at the table and that we are significant, our contribution is very significant. We need to participate in education. We need to participate in politics. We need to participate in policy planning and its implementation. If you don't have this understanding, then maybe you're at the wrong table. But then this afternoon, as we are here to talk about feminist leadership, one thing that I would say about the role of feminist leadership is that you can't develop society without women. It's the truth. You can't have a holistic development without involving the majority of society in it, which is women, okay? So as feminist leaders, we need to make sure that we understand what we are fighting for. We understand what we are here to talk about. We understand why we are fighting for this. Are we fighting for this for the, that baby girl? Are we fighting for it for the teenage girl? Are we fighting for it for the marginalized woman? Is it that her rights are concerned, her empowerment are concerned? These are some of the things that we really, really, really need to take into consideration when we are having conversations about gender equality and then as feminist leaders, we can't do this alone. Can you imagine having just five people talking about gender equality for the whole world? You can just imagine how draining that would be and how impossible that would be. It only means that we need to empower more of ourselves. If you are a leader of young women, you have a colleague, empower them with the right knowledge, with the right experience, with the right exposure. If they are empowered, then our army grows. Because mind you, the battle is a long-standing one. It's a long-standing one. And we need all of us to come on board. We need everybody, both male, female, boys, girls, traditional leaders, policymakers, each and every one of us to come on board. And then I, I always ask myself, so someone fought for this moment for me, this moment that I have to speak about gender equality, someone fought for it for me. So if I should sit down and not do anything about it, what then am I doing for the next girl? That is it for me. So anyone who is at the table to talk about gender equality, it should come from a point where you really understand and believe that indeed 
girls need a seat at the table. Our contributions are very important and relevant to society's development. Thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you as well, Ruth. Uh, of course, I just wanted to recognize great introduction, Madeline. And thank you for setting the tone of this discussion. And an important part and an important point of this learning event is, of course, recognizing the inequalities within education and the inequalities produced by the current content of education and how this can be addressed by feminist leadership in and through education. Um, what Ruth says is does ring true to me. We have different chains that we're trying to unlock, whether it be with our traditions and our culture, whether it be the institutions, whether it be the patriarchal system that shape our society right now and the systems of knowledge, and including the, the systems of knowledge and the content of education. And it's, it's just amazing, you know, education is one of the keys to one of these chains. And it's something that we really need to put emphasis on. And when we talk about education, of course, it cannot be separated from young people. And which, which is uh, what Ruth is also saying, that there should be no discussion about us without us. And Ruth is definitely right. Young feminist leadership in and outside of school um, and, through, and gender equality in and through education is an important aspect of feminist leadership because feminism knows no age. Uh, many young feminists have ventured into the world of academia. However, this field, of course, is not without its elitism and the barriers to participation of women for decades. Fida, can you please speak on these inequalities and the possible solutions um, based on your own experience? Yeah, thank you, Shama. Thank you so much. I'm very uh, pleased to be here among all of you. Um, so I'm going to just uh, note that, uh, you know, in academia, even before COVID, uh, there is, there was, there still is a lot of inequalities. And we see that it's a bottom uh, heavy, uh, you know, sector where women mostly work at lower level. And we see very few women uh, as full professor level and in decision making roles. But interestingly, you know, with COVID-19, uh, this has exacerbated the gender inequalities. And I was re reading, you know, some, some publications saying that the number of publications, you know, during the last year dropped significantly more for women compared to men. So women are not able to publish as much as men because of COVID. And second, I think, and they are related, male academics are four times more likely to have a spouse at home that takes care of the kids, while as female academics have four times, you know, less the chance to do so. And these are interrelated. And we still see if you read, you know, the UN reports, care work is mostly, you know, a, a burden on women. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, over the last 15 years, we've seen that women's uh, time on care work decreased by 10 minutes and the men's share on care work has increased by only 13 minutes. So we see that, you know, we need to really uh, be careful about that. I want to share a personal story, uh, you know, uh, to illustrate how I struggled as a young academic and how then I became a feminist and trying to help people uh, through the position that I'm in. So I joined, uh, you know, the American University of Beirut. I was still in my late 20s. So I was young. I was a female. And, uh, you know, I tried to, uh, you know, uh, start publishing. Etc. Of course, I did not have any role models because there weren't any female academics at higher level. I wasn't mentored. And it was very hard for me to publish in international and in top journals in, you know, mostly in the UK or the US. And I felt perhaps my scholarship was not that strong, but sometimes really the feedback would be very harsh. Like it's clear that uh, they are not considering this kind of work. Uh, and I think it has to uh, do with my position and here, you know, just touching uh, upon intersectionality. So uh, a woman, a young and also from the global south trying to, to publish there where the gatekeepers are mostly, uh, you know, uh, men from the global north. Um, so uh, I thought that, you know, the problem was me. And uh, I think this is a common uh, feeling. We feel that we are the problem. But then I started meeting other colleagues and then we realized that we shared similar 
concerns. We had young children at that time. We were struggling between work and uh, um, and home, and also trying to publish. Uh, so we started reading more about it, and this is how I started, you know, reading about you know gender and feminism because my training was in human resource management, and focusing, you know, on how to uh, increase productivity of employees. Uh, and what have you. So that was a field that was totally new to me. I started reading and with some colleagues, we started reading more and more and doing research until we realized that the problem is not us, the women. The problem is in the systems and the patriarchal structure, structures and paternalism and sexism, etc. cetera. So, uh, so we said, you know, as we were growing into our careers, we worked together, we were able you know, to connect and, and publish because we used to go to conferences. We met a lot of you know, senior female academics that were super, super helpful and developmental, that mentored us, the PDWs, for example, the professional development workshops were super helpful. So we met a very, uh, you know, um, very accomplished female scholars that were super, um, developmental, they were like feminist leaders helping us. And that was really very great. So now I'm uh, a chair of a department. I'm also an associate editor in a journal. And I try to as much as possible because uh, in the International Journal of HR, since I'm located in Beirut, I handle all the publications about the Middle East region, mostly. Um, and so I really spend a lot of time to provide authors with developmental feedback uh, so that uh, they have, you know, a chance to publish as opposed to just reject. So I think it's harder for academics, you know, in, in the global south uh, to make it and, uh, you know, applying feminist leadership principles could support. Uh, just very quickly, because I don't want to exceed my time, we created a center for inclusive business and leadership at the business school. And that's a different story because creating this center at the business school was a fight in itself. And people in the arts and science, humanities, and uh, you know, did not, uh, they cannot understand that there could be real feminists in the business school. So they were looking down at us and then uh, there were a lot of politics involved, but we were happy to create the center uh, and we do train HR, uh, you know, managers and employers across the Arab Middle East region on inclusive HR practices. We've created certifications in order to encourage them to apply more inclusive HR practices. We have also developed courses at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level, especially in the Master of HR, to include ethics, diversity, and inclusion within considerations of HR decisions. We created a whole different course as well on gender uh, work and inclusive uh, work systems. So I think, uh, you know, these courses have been extremely well received and the students get shocked when they see the numbers and the low numbers of women's, you know, labor force participation, the barriers women face they get shocked because they have no idea that it is so low. And uh, I think creating awareness among students, uh, you know, female students, they feel empowered. At least they know what to expect in the workplace. So they are better prepared to uh, negotiate, to ask for uh, equal treatment and not to be taken by surprise, uh, you know, when they go there. And it also raises awareness among young male students to be more mindful of the biases and the gender inequalities and about, you know, the system so that they think in more, uh, in more inclusive ways. And finally, we, la we had a grant uh, from EU to develop gender equality plans at the university level. So the project is called Targeted MPI. We're doing it in collaboration with five other universities in the uh, in Europe, and I'm very proud of this project because at the, we, our job would be to uh, develop, implement, and monitor gender equality plans at the business school that applies to faculty, that applies to students, that applies to staff. So we track, you know, a series of uh, indicators. We have gender disaggregated data throughout the processes to include that there are no 
uh, hidden biases or unconscious biases or even conscious biases, you know, in decisions of recruiting, of admissions, of promotions, of contract renewals, and even the small tasks, you know, um, you know, sometimes we don't pay attention to, but I've noted because I started tracking in my department, you know, as chair of the department, the service of faculty members. And we see that we tend to ask women to serve more on committees that include a lot of work, such as student affairs, disciplinary committees. So, you know, having numbers and tracking, I think, is key if we want to ensure that there is equality. Even in the applications for graduate studies, we really track, you know, male, female applicants and the success rates of interviews. And I think it's uh, data, and I cannot really emphasize the importance of data. Data is very important. Whatever we're doing, uh, we need to collect gender disaggregated data, identify if we're doing something wrong, because often we don't do things wrong because we are bad people. You know, we all have good intentions we want to support, but each one of us has unconscious biases. They have hidden biases. They don't feel that they are doing harm. Uh, but even the most feminist people that have the most awareness sometimes do fall you know, victim of, of biases. So data is key to empower, uh, you know, decision makers and to empower people to make decisions uh, that can ensure more inclusive, uh, you know, workplaces, be it in academia or somewhere else. I'm sorry if I took more time and I'm going to stop here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. I'm going to pass quickly, um, actually, through to Natalie who is uh, at Action Aid in Senegal and asked Natalie to give some insights into what she's been experiencing and what she's seeing around feminist leadership in her work. Natalie? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me very well? Very well, yes, thanks. Okay, I think I'm on move. Oh, building on, on uh, what has been said, I'm, I'm working for an organization which is a feminist organization, activist and feminist organization, that consider um, education as one of the key for change within our society. And when we talk about feminist leadership, it brought to my mind the issue of dismantling yes. Uh, Ruth was, was, uh, has touched the point already about the need to change the mindset. The mindset which is affected or, or, or strongly uh, um, imposed by the patriarchal uh, norms and rules where we, we, we see a limited space for women and uh, more space for men without giving clear reason of this inequality. And in our um, habit, in our area of work, we unconsciously uh, duplicate this mindset. And feminist leadership help to, 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 to review that kind of mindset because it's not only a matter of human rights for, for, for us, for me, it's also a matter of uh, um, uh, justice. And if we, 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 we don't apply uh, uh, the feminism leadership principles, it means that we're just looking at one possibility or an option. It shouldn't be an option. Because still in our society, women are under patriarchal and social norms. No matter uh, the level of education you will have, the, the, the level of uh, 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 wealth you, you can have, you will still be uh, um, under this, the, the socialization that can move you to, to, to one, from one place to another one without your, um, uh, con without your, um, uh, you being uh, uh, decision makers only because you are a woman, only because of that. And for us, this is not fair. So education is for us one of the, the strategic engagement where we go through some step-by-step -step to make people adhere to the change that is needed. Because change is needed, really, for our society. The half part of the world is uh, made of women. We need to, to recognize that and to celebrate that. We can't be in the world with such a huge amount, let's say that, of women and say that they are not able to. 
they are just good for for cooking, for 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 uh, uh, giving birth, for staying at home. One of my colleagues, when we were doing, we were in the the the, the, the lockdown in Senegal. One day he called me saying that if COVID, in, if coronavirus uh, doesn't kill me, my, ch my children will kill me because it's just crazy how they are noisy and they, 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 how they are, they, are, they are making trouble. I can't understand how my, my, my wife can afford that, you see. So this means that we have power, we have energy, so we are able to contribute to change. The other thing is about uh, uh, that education, and I think uh, Fida talk about it also, is the need to have role model, and this can come for me mostly from education sector. Having someone who can show you that the change, in another world is possible. Having someone who can show you that you are able to do so. You are uh, strong enough. You are intelligent enough. It can make a difference. And for me, there is no better place than education, than classroom, like we, we, we say. And, uh, and uh, using feminist principles and uh, uh, to apply it to the, 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 the human rights lens, it will help us to look at where are the gaps and what are needed to be done to bring the real equality that we are, we are all talking about uh, um, today. I will stop there to not uh, go out of my, my time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie, very powerful. I think every feminist do, does understand that um, the political work that we are on right now is about um, dismantling this oppressive system and that it especially oppresses women, trans and gender non-conforming people. You know, the, uh, the bullying, the abuse, the violence, the harassment that we experience on a daily basis. And I guess that is true that education is one of the it, while it is true that education is one of the tools that we are able to break free from a patriarchal system, um, educational institutions, however, have also been uh, tools to oppress many women, trans and gender nonconforming people. Um, coming from my experience, um, I have received many unwanted advances from um, my teachers uh, in university. As a young queer feminist, um, my friends have, uh, my trans friends have been called animalistic by some of their teachers. And um, there's just so much that the educational system can contribute to the well-being, the knowledge of young people, and to the inculcation of the many values that we are that we that we want to pass on to the next generation, and we want that to be feminist and not be violent. And um, I think this is something that um, definitely affects everybody, not just young queer feminists, not just young queer people, but also. Some of our boys, I'm also very worried about the toxic masculinity that we're passing on to the next generation of men. Um, Aruna, our next speaker, could you please speak on violence and harassment, mm -hmm. its relations to patriarchy and how we can build differently, especially during COVID and after COVID? Yeah, thank you so much, Shama. Um, you've touched on the whole question of sexual harassment, abuse, and violence against girls in schools. And this is, of course, a complete violation of the trust that societies place in schools, <clears throat> you know, to look after the well-being of their, of their children, <clears throat> let alone being a barrier to, sorry, to girls' education. <clears throat> um, and I just want to mention in this context the EI, Angai, and Gender at Work uh, program that's been going on now for, um, I think, about five years, um, that's specifically focused on school-related gender-based violence. Um, so it's not only violence against women and girls, but also boys. And using feminist principles and using feminist practices to work closely with teachers, to create safe spaces to discuss the roots of these uh, behaviors, um, to model new kinds of behaviors uh, and to build new kinds of relationships of trust and creating new norms and 
practices to live by. Um, and when you think about it, you know, violence or the threat of violence is a characteristic weapon of those who hold power in patriarchal institutions. Um, it's not just focused on schools. It is, you know, they're prevalent in many other patriarchal institutions. And it's used to enforce compliance and it's used to stifle dissent, often um, with full impunity. Um, and so schools, like many other institutions, are built on hierarchical and patriarchal foundations. And in many places, they, they uh, function not to foster creativity and dissidence or to unveil the mind, to use the words of Nawal Sadawi, a, a very well-known Egyptian feminist who passed away this week, but in fact to instill compliance and to maintain order and introduce rote learning. Um, and in fact, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, new knowledge and feminists, uh, feminists are creating, just like Fida was talking about, feminists are creating new knowledge in the um, academy. Uh, and there is a lot of focus in schools on the quality of education, not just on numbers. Now, like other patriarchal institutions, um, uh, trade unions or state institutions, multilateral organizations, um, which monopolize decision making, you know, in ways that are really important and that affect our lives. Um, schools, we have found, um, while all of you have spoken of different ways in which to try to chip away at some of these deep structures in schools, they have been very slow to change. And schools are not the only kind of institution um, that's been very slow to change. So one of the questions you know, we could ask ourselves, um, and it's very important when we think about how do we build back better post COVID, right? Is to ask ourselves, have our strategies really been effective? How good have they been? You know, um, what have we gained from these strategies that we've used? Um, what are the fruits that we've gained? Do we need to push harder and better? You know, this is always the, the mantra for feminists in change. Do it better, push harder, be more effective, be more strategic, right? Or uh, do we need to imagine different forms of change? You know, the latest global gender data um, says that closing the global gender gap, it's going to take 99 years. So we don't have 99 years, right? So should we be more forcefully dismantling patriarchy and patriarchal institutions and building new feminist forms and new models of learning in and putting them in their place? I think it's a question we need to think about. The COVID pandemic has, as you know, has put a, a real spotlight on um, many important societal choices, right, that we make about what we value, what we don't value, um, whose labor we count, whose labor we don't count, Fida referred to this. Um, and it's brought right front and center the structural roots of oppression and inequality, right? So when we're thinking of building back, um, what are some lessons we can draw from the, you know, the, the crisis of COVID, but not only the crisis of COVID, it's also been uh, multiple crises that have come together, economic crises, climate crisis, they're coming together. And so this moment is very different from other moments that we faced. And it is a moment of rage, but it's also a moment of hope. And there's a growing agreement um, across the world that you know, the way we structure our lives, economic lives, our political life, our social life, should be organized around care for people and care for the planet, right? That's becoming a central focus. And the other, you know, the old idea that, you know, Madeline and I will remember from way back is, you know, the notion that, because you all guys are much younger, um, the notion that, you know, your freedom is tied to my freedom, now that's coming back into four. We are interdependent, right? Um, and our joint, our collective future is going to be vital to our shared emancipation. And, um, and in fact, you know, there was a recent UN Women Conference that was held um, during the, ep the epidemic. 
<clears throat> that was looking at inequalities and structural transformation. And, you know, all these economists concluded that care is not just a women's issue. It is an existential question for mankind, right? So that's really something very important. Now, to go back to the question, um, Shama, you raised this about, you know, these institutions, um, maybe they've just outlived their purpose, right? Um, power dynamics and systems of and organizational forms that we see in educational systems and in other kinds of systems, in one sense, they've kind of outlived their purpose. You know, uh, we've really worked hard at them. We've tried to change them. Um, and what we're often finding is that you, you make one step forward, but it's often, you know, two steps back that the, the default is to slide back to patriarchal practices, to slide back to, you know, um, misogynistic ways of operating. And so that's an important lesson for us. You know, if that is the case, then, you know, what does that mean for building back better? And, you know, the current zeitgeist is is really uh, more, it's, it's leaning more towards smash and, and start over rather than reform at a time when political forces are arrayed against justice and equality. And they're very strong and they're very organized. And so, you know, Arundhati Roy, um, the Indian author said that the pandemic is an opportunity to break with the past and imagine another world. So I would put it to all of us, maybe we should ask ourselves, how do we focus on, what if we focus on dismantling patriarchy? And can we imagine what new feminist organizational forms that center care and connectivity, what would they look like? And how would we get there? Thank you. Aruna, feminist schools, feminist schools, feminist universities, dismantle the institutions that we have today so we can have better feminist institutions for the future. Wow, that's a lot for us to debate and discuss. But I'm going to pass first to Aileen, our activist from uh, Las Niñas Lideran in Gela in Guatemala. Eileen, what have been your experiences or any comments you want to make on what you've been hearing so far? Thank you very much for the invitation to this panel, which is a truly intergenerational space. Uh, my name is Eileen, I'm from Guatemala, and since 2016, I'm part of the departmental network Let Girls Lead in Quetzaltenango, supported by Rise Up. Um, well, in this network, we are 13 girls and teenagers who learn about leadership, politics, human rights. So as an 18 years old uh, feminist activist, I have learned that feminist leadership is, one of, uh, is the one that promotes uh, changes and actions to improve the world we live in. And by this, maintaining respect and challenge how we, things work around us. And when we talk about feminist leadership in education that we have been discussing now, one of the most important topics that we have to raise awareness is about the school-related gender violence. Um, and this is a huge issue. Um, to give context, over 115 million children and adolescents experience violence in different ways, psychological, physical, sexual, uh, one uh, in schools every year. Um, so from our work as the network, we have seen and learned the importance of practice feminism values in schools as equality, respect, inclusion, and the necessity to talk about uh, topics as consent. Because when teachers and students put um, these values in practice, they raise awareness of this issue. For example, I can imagine that in a classroom, teachers and students discuss about these uh, topics and they are gonna put in practice this in the classroom and then in the school, then in their families and then in the community. So I truly believe that education and schools are a key um, point or a tool to continue working on this. 
And it's important to, to promote educational policies that include equality within the schools and to ask our governments to fully commit with this. Um, so I would like to share too about the importance of the youth feminist organisms, um, because I think that it's something that has been um, increasing lately that young people is getting involved in these activities as we are having now. And I think that it's really important to continue promoting these spaces so we can com uh, we can share our uh, experiences too. Um, as young leaders, we have proposals uh, in mind and we have energy to work. However, the economic resources um, are necessary to carry out the projects. For example, in the network, we promote actions, uh, but we also are interested in advocacy, reaching decision makers, so they are the ones who invest in these projects. I think that it's something that hasn't been happening, that the government get involved in this, but we need to take them and we have to call their attention to. Um, for the network, these global alliances that we're having now are really important because we can share experience, we can learn more, and as I have been learning for everyone who has been talking today, and give solutions to. Um, also to seek financing for projects since uh, sometimes it's really difficult to find it. Um, it is time to both young and adult leaders uh, to come together and continue working together. This is very important since we are going to start opening this gap so that soon we can be part of those who make decisions, these young leaders, these young feminisms, we can join you to this team and to start taking these decisions. So I'm really thank you to each of the people who are working for creating in this world uh, equal, uh, a future with equality. And I would like to finish sharing with you uh, one phrase of the declaration of Las Niñas Lidera, and it says, this is, this is the moment in which one teenager and one teenager and 250 millions of teenagers are shouting out loud, this is the moment, this is your moment, this is my moment, yes, this is our moment. Gracias, Aileen. Thank you so much. I love your passion. And um, thank you so much for organizing and mobilizing young girls against uh, school-related gender-based violence in Guatemala. I think that you are very powerful, you're a rock star, and you're a source of inspiration. And thank you for shedding a spotlight on the importance of having girls lead and letting girls lead, um, and the importance of funding um, the processes and of, of supporting girls to be able to lobby for advocacies and proposals. I think that's very important and thank you very much for highlighting that as, as well in your speech. You're so amazing. I love it. Um, but right now we have so many questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Madeline to ask the first question to our panel. Right. Thanks very much. We have um, just under 15 minutes. So there's a question from Christy Mulgard. Um, and she's asking, what role can technology play in delivering education to achieve gender parity? I think Ruth and uh, Fida, you both have something to say about that. Ruth first. Okay, so um, using technology to, to achieve gender parity. I think Eileen mentioned a bit of this, which comes to the content of the education itself. We all know that technology is a very powerful tool. And then just in recent times, you, we've all seen how open the world has been to everyone through technology. So I would say that technology plays a very crucial role in achieving gender parity. And it goes down to the content, the content of the education. If girls are in school, can they relate to the content being taught? The stories, can they identify themselves with the stories that they are seeing? If there is a discussion, the heroes in the discussion, are they people that they can relate to? Are they people that they can identify with? So to use technology, it boils down to the content. The content must change because what we have is patriarchal, yes. So the content must change. It must, it must be deliberate and intentional about the fact that if a, if a young girl picks this, I can relate to it. I can identify with what it's in there. And that's where the empowerment comes in. 
So gradually, mm-hmm. if we are able to have the content being changed, and it's something that girls and young women can identify to, then we will be achieving gender parity with time, actually. So yes, Thank the content you. must change. Thank you. Thanks. So Ruth is convinced of the importance of technology. What about the digital divide, Fida? Yes, so I want to, you know, uh, disagree with Ruth because I say in the current situation, if nothing is done, uh, you know, and and there's a a policy or there's funds or budgets done to uh, remove the digital divide, technology will increase inequalities because we speak and we acknowledge today that I personally speak for myself, I am in a position of privilege. I have electricity, I have internet, and I have a laptop to connect. So for me, it is something positive, but uh, uh, there are many others uh, who do not have access to electricity, who do not have access to laptops, who do not have access to the internet. So with the technology and the online learning, it will exacerbate inequalities because those who can have access to it will, and those who can don't have the infrastructure will be, uh, will be left out. So for me, yes, uh, technology is a powerful tool, but we need to uh, you know, have a budget, we need to have a, a policy that will help connect the disconnected. Uh, and that, uh, you know, as mentioned by Ruth, I agree that we need to ensure digital literacy in the curriculum because you know, this is important. This is very important if we think that in 10 years, most of the job creations will be in the STEM field. Uh, so science, technology, education, and uh, sorry, uh, uh, engineering and math. Uh, so it's very important uh, that uh, you know the curriculum has digital literacy. But I insist on the need to see who will be left out from online learning and how can we, what can we do to support them and to connect them. So connect the disconnected. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth and uh, Fida, for your answers. Um, We go on to the next question because we only have a a few minutes more. Uh, The next question is from Michelle. Uh, Are there any examples of men who are acting and behaving as feminist leaders? Does the panel think this is even a possibility? Natalie, you you wanted to say something about this? I will say strongly yes. And the very first example that comes to my, my mind is my father. I'm coming from a community where we practice, we heavily practice FGM and where we are still in uh, child marriage. But my father positioned himself between tradition and, uh, and his uh, uh, daughter. We are four girls. And uh, it brought a lot of change within our family. In my work, I meet also some some men. In Senegal, for example, there is a men organization that is advocating for gender equality. And we are are collaborating with them because they recognize that we can't build a a, a just and an equal society without supporting uh, women. They don't see the, 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 the women leadership as uh, an, uh, um, a threat to uh, patriarchy or to men's power. They see it as a matter of justice. So they, I, I consider as a feminist and our, our colleague uh, from uh, the global platform are uh, strongly uh, work, working with them. The global platform is the youth activism organization. And they are, they are engaging with them to, to promote that kind of uh, uh, behavior from men. We have some religious leaders, even at community level, who are even more uh, open minded. We are even surprised about that uh, than uh, women themselves, because women have been uh, f- um, socialized to think like that. So uh, the support of men are really, really helpful to change and we can get some of them maybe not all of them but at at least some. (laughs) thank you thanks thanks natalie um there's a question here from jenny to fida um she's uh says it's very interesting she's very interested in the data collection that you spoke about and the mainstreaming for inclusion but she's wondering whether you also track data on disability or is the focus just on gender and if it's on gender do you also take into account non-binary 
Okay, thank you for the question. I just want to know that we're still at a very early stage, so we're just launching the product. Now we are in the process of thinking of indicators that we will use to evaluate, you know, uh, the implementation of the gender equality plans. Uh, so uh, the, the, the grant itself focuses on gender, and we look at also non-binary people, so we have a spectrum of how people, you know, uh, we have the biological, you know, sex, and also we have how people identify, uh, so the gender. And uh, the purpose is to be inclusive. Um, um, so uh, for me, because I'm the lead, uh, you know, investigator on this project in UB, I'm planning on making it inclusive, not only for gender, but also for tracking disabilities. We also track, uh, you know, different nationalities. Um, and uh, because in Lebanon also, we have various religious sects, so we could also track this to ensure that there's no sectarian discrimination or gender discrimination or people with disabilities. So we will definitely include that. Uh, thank you. And we already have faculty members with disabilities, but the issue is we need, uh, you cannot, uh, you know, um, uh, hire people with disabilities if you do not provide them with the environment where they can thrive. So we need to buy equipment, we need to ensure accessibility, uh, and we're we're working on this. We were successful with one uh, colleague. We were able to get the equipment with visual impairment, but I think uh, it has to be systematized uh, and ensure that the environment in itself allows for people with disabilities to be as productive and as comfortable in the workplace as others. Thank you so much, Fida. Um, we have another question from the group uh, from Wethera. What does the panel think about looking at education in a holistic way and focusing on the following three types of education, namely material, human, and spiritual? Um, Aruna, maybe you wanted to speak on this? Um, I Thanks for the question. Um, uh, I, I think that, you know, certainly the looking at holistic, using a holistic lens to look at education, the content of education is very important. Um, what you know whatever categories you use and you know there may be a different set of categories that I may use and you use but um it it is you know it's it's very um the the issue you raise around spiritual bringing that into um into sort of the mainstream is very important because it is something that is um it's a it's a part of us that's kept very much out of um any public engagement um and and of course you know just just by the example that um natalie gave you know about her own father there's we have there's uh, individual volition individual intent individual um aspirations that can you know that are very um important in this whole change process um and so that not separating these things but creating a space where there is um, understanding of different streams of knowledge, different ways of being. Um, and, and one of the aspects that I think that feminist scholarship has, has really given a lot of value to is questioning what it is that's defined as knowledge, what it is that's valued. You know, Fida referred to this when she talked about um, you know what gets what gets published and what doesn't get published, and um, and that's a very important part of feminist scholarship, which is really opening up what is defined as you know uh, important and new perspectives that come from people who are um, at very different spaces and very different places, who are more on the sort of a structural periphery, if you will, than rather than the center. And those um, new insights are um, are so important for um, for challenging some of the hierarchies, you know, in knowledge systems. So it's definitely a holistic and a more inclusive um, way of thinking about education and uh, presenting these alternatives and presenting a space for dissent and questioning is um, going to is really critical in um, in education. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Aruna. Uh, what a great way to end the, the question and answer portion. I would like to thank everybody uh, for your questions and for joining us in this webinar. You have definitely made this your own brave space and I have truly enjoyed the vibrant discussions that we've had. Uh, this is definitely not the action where the action ends. Our conversations should continue in our own communities, including the fact of actively creating an intergenerational feminist space rooted in mutual mentorship and equal partnership. My deepest gratitude to the panel as well. Your powerful pieces that are rooted in your own experiences truly proves that the personal is political and feminist leadership is exactly what we need, especially in times of emergencies and crises like in COVID. A language and a culture of care and connectivity indeed. Your statements and actions have also shown that feminist leadership is not only a pipe dream. It's here, you're here, we're here. We are creating our own feminist realities and we have built the foundations for it and it can only grow from there. From the young feminists who are here and to everyone who is interested, I invite you to check out Solidarity, zine of Transform Education and Network of Young Feminists that I'm part of, hosted by United Nations Girls Education Initiative. We dream of a world that is rooted in feminist leadership. I think Gloria is going to put the link in the chat. This is Transform Education. This is our love letter to you. Love and solidarity to everyone. Mabuhay from the Philippines. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Well done, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.